Welcome, Michael Provence, a professor of history at uh, the University of California, San Diego. We appreciate you returning for part two of your discussion on Syria and the wider area. Um, just on the news the, the other day, shots were fired from Syria into Turkey. I think a Turkish citizen was killed. Uh, there's a serious refugee problem on the border. Uh, and there's talk now in the media of intervention. So there's NATO. Turkey's a member of NATO. There's the United Nations. There's covert intervention, if any intervention. Can you talk to me a little bit about what you know or you surmise about the possibilities of intervention and how this internal Syrian conflict may spread vis-a-vis -vis Turkey and so on? Yeah. I don't think there's any possibility of intervention. I don't think there will be any intervention. Um, and some of the people who have talked about intervention are, are I mean, it's fanciful and ridiculous. So the Qataris, the, the government of Qatar, uh, and the Saudis, who are, especially the Saudis, are uh, long-standing um, uh, enemies, for their own reasons, uh, sectarian enemies, in fact, of, of, uh, of Syria, of um, secular Arab nationalism, uh, which the Syrian state once represented and doesn't represent any longer. Um, so the, Syrian, this, the Saudis and some of the Gulf monarchies have their own reasons, long-standing historical reasons, for animosity with Syria. Some of these countries have talked about arming the rebels. This is nonsense. There is no way that Qatar or the Saudis can arm anyone in Syria. Uh, in order to do this, they would have to either take the arms into the Damascus airport, which is under the control of the central government, obviously, uh, or they would have to move them through a neighboring country. They will not be able to do this. None of the neighboring countries would permit this, uh, including Turkey. Um, none of the countries in the region, including Israel, uh, or the United States for that matter, are interested in, uh, all of them would like this just to stop. Um, they may not like the, the, uh, the Syrian government, uh, but from a geopolitical standpoint, they are more worried about chaos and, and, and uh, conflict that will spread beyond Syria uh, than anything else. And so the prospect of arming rebels or prolonging the conflict or intervening in any significant way is not in the cards, no matter what anybody says. Uh, it's, it's um, I mean, it's, it's just not a, not a, a, a real... Uh, possibility. It may be a stick or a kind of a lever uh, to use against, uh, against uh, the Syrian government, against the Russians perhaps, but it's not a serious prospect. You know, you said something interesting a minute ago about, uh, you know, Israel's view. Israel uh, says it's, of itself that it's the only democracy in the Middle East, but you characterize that they're afraid of widespread chaos. But I thought the overthrow of a, of a dictatorship, as you're, you're describing it, might be in the interests of democracies. Talk a little bit more what you mean by regional chaos. Well, the, the, I mean, who, who benefits and who doesn't benefit by regional chaos? If you're overthrowing Assad, uh, what, what's to fear? Well, the Israelis have discovered that they love Assad, actually, that they love Bashar al-Assad. Why is that? Well, because he represents uh, a, a, a stable geopolitical uh, system that the Israelis dominate militarily, diplomatically, economically. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a, uh, a belated uh, uh, proclamation of love, but it's a proclamation of love just the same. Um, so are you saying the Israelis would be on Assad's side rather than on the side of the uh, insurgents? They're, they're, it's, it's absolutely clear. I mean, it's, uh, there's no question about it. And it's been stated clearly over and over again. Last year uh, in May, uh, the late, I think it was May anyway, the late uh, uh, um, New York Times correspondent Anthony Shadid was granted a visa to go and visit Damascus, all the foreign journalists, which is to say Arab journalists, Iranian journalists, Western journalists, everybody had been kicked out of the country. Shadid was given a visa to enter Damascus for five hours. He went and he uh, interviewed Rami Mahlouf, the, uh, the president's cousin, the, uh, the richest man in Syria. Uh, and Mahlouf said, uh, only we 
can protect the Israelis. He said this in an interview. Now, the following day, the Syrian ambassador to the United States, uh, Imad Mustafa, had to issue a kind of a, a, a defense in the pages of the New York Times where he wrote, uh, under his ambassadorial letterhead, uh, Rami Makhalouf does not speak for the Syrian government. He is a private citizen. This is a joke. Everyone knows that he's not a private citizen. He's the most powerful country in the per person in the country next to the president. Maybe more powerful than the president. Nobody knows for sure. And so for him to say, uh, we can destabilize the entire region. We stand between chaos and, and, uh, and order. And only we can protect the Israeli government is a kind of a... a an inversion of the traditional uh, uh, rhetoric of legitimacy of the Syrian state that is breathtaking to behold. Uh, it's not lost on the Israelis. It's not lost on the Syrians. It's not lost on the Pentagon or the State Department that, that, uh, that a weakened Assad is dangerous, but a swept away Assad is very dangerous. Uh, and, and this is, this is uh, I mean, there are, people who are, are uh, continually engaged in fantasies about the Middle East. Uh, we used to call people in the government uh, who, who held these kinds of dreams neocons, who dream of a giant reordering of everything. Uh, but this is a, a, is a rather marginal tendency these days. And so there are people who would say, well, if Syria goes, then we can do what we want in Syria. And Hezbollah will be uh, cut off in Lebanon, and then we can do what we want there. And then the Iranians will not be able to mess around, and we can do what we want over there, so we can have a war with Syria and a war with Iran and take over Lebanon, and wouldn't it be grand? But fortunately, this is no longer a, a, a kind of a, a, a standpoint which I think is very widely held, uh, because the, 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 the self-delusional aspect of it is, I think, more apparent than it was, say, in 2003 when many people in positions of tremendous power in the Bush administration uh, in Israel and elsewhere actually did talk about this kind of nonsense and, and delusional fantasy uh, publicly. So I think, I think that, that, uh, that that's finished. But this is, I, I mean, we need to be, to be, uh, to be frank here about what the, the, the crimes of the Syrian government are, are significant and terrible. Uh, and the prospects of intervention are minimal. And if intervention takes place, it will not be for the reasons that the Syrian opposition uh, would like. It'll be because it's in the interest of some state, some neighboring state, to do it. Like, like who? Well, there are, isn't any at the moment, and that's why it won't happen. Uh, because it doesn't appear to be in anybody's interest to get involved in, in, uh, in, in conflict in Syria. Arguably, it's not even in the interest of the opposition in Syria itself because, as I said a few minutes ago, the, the Syrian government is, is not, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want to use the word restrained because I think it's, it's, it's an obscenity to say it restrained. Obscenity, uh, restrained is wrong, but they could be much more murderous than they have been. Not on an atrocity level, but on a, a, number, a level of sheer numbers. And if there was an intervention, if there was a significant uh, military threat posed by the Free Syrian Army within Syria, and there is not today, they are not formidable. They are not in a position to challenge the government or the army on any, on any military basis. But if that changed, the forces of repression would be fully unleashed. And the Syrian army would not be going in with, 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 with machine guns and light artillery. They would be going in with airstrikes. You're painting a pretty dark picture. So my, my, I guess my, my question is, so where is this going to go if there's no intervention and the opposition doesn't have the strength to really do what it likes to do? What's the end game? Well, uh, no one knows, of course. But the idea that we have to do something 
is not necessarily a very, that something has to be done immediately, that we have to act, that other people have to act, I think is, is, is as, as horrible and is, and is heartbreaking uh, and is uh, just m miserably sad as that is, I think that there is no useful role that any outside power can really play apart from what is being done now and what has been done in terms of, of uh, giving people the ability to leave, to flee the country, to be fed in Turkey or in Jordan, uh, to seize the assets of the Syrian government, to put the entire ruling structure under sanction, which has been done, to, to strangle the economy of Syria, which is in the control of, this, of this, these cadres at the top, uh, to, um, to progressively delegitimize internally and externally the Syrian leadership, uh, and to attempt to the extent possible to make it more difficult for the government to repress with military means the population. Uh, so the, the UN um, has a mission and there was a, an Arab League mission with observers and it was unsuccessful. This was some months ago. But at that time, uh, fewer people were getting killed uh, for that period of a few weeks. Um, so these kinds of things are not dramatic and they're not satisfying and they don't make people feel better because so many people for good reason are 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 heartbroken and and want to do something but the truth is is that most of us are helpless and doing something may not be doing the wrong thing uh, could be more damaging to the long-term prospects of the Syrian population than than uh, than than, than doing nothing. The government, the government is, is, many people, I, th I, I believe this and I hope that this is true, the government is morally weakened. Uh, now, in other similar sorts of circumstances like Iran, for example, um, we had a, 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 a scholar of Iran uh, named Nader Hashemi come and visit UCSD a, a couple months ago and he said, the only thing that can save the Iranian government in the long term is an external strike. So the Syrian government now is internally delegitimized. The number of people who turn against it within the population passively, actively to demonstrate whatever is increasing and will continue to increase. However, if the kinds of things that the Syrian government has said to legitimize its repression of its own population over the last year are suddenly validated by external moves the government will be weak, will be strengthened internally and externally. And, and this is not something that people should want, if you see what I mean. So an external threat, a, a legitimate external threat uh, from outside, especially from the United States or from the Gulf powers, uh, will strengthen the Syrian government in the short term and allow it to crush uh, the, the opposition more definitively, more decisively than it can do now, I think. I don't know if, uh, if you or anyone knows, knows enough to answer this question, but I, re I remember uh, at the beginning of the Libyan intervention, uh, there were lots of people who said Obama should do more and take the leadership, we should do this and we should do that. You had McCain and you had Hawks and, and all the rest of it. And we're, we're kicking off an election year. And I just wonder what you think about Syrian intervention by the United States in some form through NATO, through the UN gets into the campaign and becomes an idea difficult to stop. Have you yeah. given that any thought at all? I haven't, and I, I mean, I, the, the, the prospect, because I do think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the difficult to stop, the, the, it's, a, it's a definitional question. Once we have a kind of a, uh, something that is defined as a problem, it has to be, it has to be dealt with. Uh, and so McCain uh, has tried to do this. He's tried to make this an issue, actually. Uh, and in the same way that, the, that, that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, AIPAC, uh, uh, and the Republican candidates have tried to make Iran an issue that has to be dealt with. This is, an, this is a terrible uh, uh, development if these kinds of things manage to, to, to take on steam, to, to get legs, as they say uh, among journalists, I think. Um, 
because they, they make action, they create an imperative for action, which is counterproductive for all, in, in, all uh, involved, I think. Uh, and, and so w hopefully that won't happen. Um, now, I, I would say that one thing that, that I think was instructive is that there was an Arab League plan some four or five months ago uh, that was created by the Arab League. Now, the Arab League doesn't do much, but it did this. It was a plan to, uh, to censor Syria, uh, to, or censure, I should say, uh, Syria, and to send observers and so on. Uh, the plan was taken to the United Nations, where from there it went to the Security Council, where the Arab League plan, which was devised by Arabs, by the Arab states, became an American plan. And once it was an American plan, the Russians could, could, could convincingly and, and legitimately oppose it. And so it was vetoed. It was vetoed or it was threatened to be vetoed by the, Soviet, by the Russians uh, in the United Nations Security Council. What this means is that the United States' involvement in these kinds of events is the kiss of death. And so if we, and maybe the people who actually advanced that plan, I don't want to be too conspiratorial here, but the people who advanced that plan, they may have known that. That if that plan succeeded, if that plan was advanced as only an Arab League plan, it would be much more difficult for other countries to oppose it. And then that would have, have uh, uh, created an imperative for some sort of action. Not military action, but some sort of action. And it's possible, not even unlikely, that the United States at that time didn't want that and so allowed that plan to go forward with its imprint, knowing that its imprint would guarantee its failure. Hmm? Uh, and so this is the sort of world we live in, uh, where the, 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 the association with the United States by the Syrian opposition, uh, by the Arab League, can serve to create a, a, a dynamic where that, those movements can be opposed more convincingly by the Syrian government. And that too can lead to greater repression and, and more, <coughs> more uh, 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 military uh, um, uh, operations by the Syrian government. So I understand this if this would be the Bush administration, but this is uh, three, three point something years of the Obama administration <laughs> where Obama kicks his administration off with a great speech in Cairo. And now you're saying America is still the kiss of death over there. So is Obama a failure in terms of Middle East policy? No, he's not a failure in terms of Middle East policy. He's, I mean, he's um, given what's possible, I, I think he's, he's done well. I mean, um, He's done well in a way that has thankfully eluded uh, the myopic and not very well informed um, uh, uh, punditry in the United States, particularly on the right. So in, in 2009, uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad of Iran was uh, campaigning for his reelection, and he was continually attempting to uh, provoke uh, the American government over and over again. And Obama, uh, to his credit, said repeatedly, well, we are sure that the Iranian public has the wisdom to decide their elections uh, wisely and, and, uh, and sensibly, and we won't get involved. So this had the effect of undermining and delegitimizing uh, Ahmadinejad and forced him, actually, to be, he was trying to create a, a, a response that would, that would bolster his popularity because uh, many people said, I, Iranian specialists, that George Bush was responsible, that the axis of evil was responsible for the election of Ahmadinejad and the, 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 the sweeping aside of the Iranian reformers. So Obama was clever enough not to play this game. And Ahmadinejad was forced to steal his election because of it. If Obama had played, had said, we won't take that. We're going we're gonna to destroy you. Uh, his popularity, Ahmadinejad's popularity, would have gone through the roof. He would have been, it would have been unnecessary to steal the election, and he would have been reelected handily. Um, so uh, no one noticed this here. Uh, not one newspaper reported this, as far as I know. Uh, but this was what was happening. And uh, it was smart, and it was clever, and it was artful. And, and I, for one, was impressed. 
Um, the situation in Egypt was impressive. Uh, I'm sure that phone calls took place between the State Department and, uh, and, and the generals, and they said, you got to cut him loose. But we're not going to cut you loose as long as you cut him loose. And by the way, don't shoot people. I'm sure these, these conversations took place. And one can, you don't have to have a, a, a sharp historical sensibility to know that no previous American administration would have been clever enough not to uh, back our dictator until the streets were, were, were running with blood, which is what Mubarak would have been happy to do. Uh, and if he had thought like the Shah did uh, and like dozens of others have done before. So this was something new. And, and uh, he's not, the president, the government, the American government is not going to get any credit for that. But historically speaking, it's new. And it was, it was wise, and it, it kept people from, from being killed. And the, the outcome was sure anyway. I mean, Mubarak was going. So the sooner the, the, and I'm sure also that people like Robert Gates and Secretary of State Clinton didn't want to cut him loose, and he overrode those people. Now I'm, I'm speculating, but I, I think that that's a, that's a reasonable speculation. I saw just yesterday on the news uh, pictures uh, in the cities with lots of tanks. Uh, where Syria get, get those tanks, and are they being resupplied, and by whom, and what does the United States think of that? Well, the entire Syrian military comes from Russia uh, and from the Soviet Union before that. And uh, the Syrians still owe the Soviet Union billions, which will never be repaid, and nobody expects it to be repaid, uh, from the resupply during the 70s, after the 73 war, uh, from the resupply after 82, uh, when the Syrians fought uh, the Israelis in Lebanon, they lost 70 fighter planes in a single day fighting against the Israeli Air Force, uh, for example. Those were airplanes were replaced. Um, <clears throat> so the entire uh, 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 armory comes from Russia. Uh, the Russians have long-term relations with, uh, with Syria, and of course Putin himself is sensitive to the possibility of a popular movement against his government uh, in, in Moscow, something which actually has been happening. So um, there's a real coalition of interests there, uh, more so right now, in fact, than in any time in the last 20 years, probably, uh, which is a, 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 a sad coincidence for, this, for the prospects of the Syrian uh, opposition. Um, this, the Russians also have a, a base in, uh, in Syria uh, near uh, the eastern, or rather the western uh, Mediterranean coast, a naval base, uh, which they want to keep. It's the only uh, Russian naval base in the Mediterranean. Uh, and for Russia, uh, an alliance with Syria, a close relationship with Syria, is a matter of, of geopolitical credibility, of prestige. Uh, of tradition, uh, so it's very important to Putin, and not something that will be, um, uh, the, the Russians will not be talked out of this. Uh, it's not something that they're going to, not something that they're going to give up on. They are committed to the survival of the, of the Syrian government as presently configured, because any other uh, possibility threatens uh, Russian interests in a way that, 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 that Putin and probably no uh, Russian uh, leader would, would countenance. So all of the talk and all of the possibilities of, of discussion uh, that take place, not only by Russia, but also by the Syrian government, are just playing for time. They're just an effort to draw out the clock, to wait until other news uh, uh, overtakes the Syrian news on the, on the headlines, uh, to allow the Syrian government time to, to crush uh, the uprising uh, in a slow uh, fashion. In a, and and that's, that's, what, that's what Russian policy really is uh, at this point. Of course, the Russians are able to resupply the Syrians as well uh, through these na this naval base and Damascus airport for that matter. So the, the Russians and the Israelis have uh, interests that are aligned here? No intervention in, the, in Don't Topple Assad? I mean, well, strange bedfellows? Uh, yes, uh, I guess they do, actually. I'm not, I mean, it's, you know, um, Turkey is kind of a wild card. 
because the Turkish government and, and, and Prime Minister Erdogan, I think, in, in a way, because the Syrian and Turkish relations were, had warmed very considerably over the last 10 years. Uh, and Erdogan was, was, uh, was inclined to publicly claim his friendship with, uh, with, with President Assad, with Bashar al-Assad. And I took part in, in academic uh, meetings between Turkish and, and Syrian scholars in Istanbul and elsewhere. These kinds of things would have been where the Syrian Minister of Culture, for example, would come and address the, the, uh, the, the, the conference. These sorts of things were inconceivable uh, during the lifetime of Hafez al-Assad. So I think that there's a sense on the part of, of uh, Erdogan and other uh, high-level high uh, uh, Turkish officials of, of of, of insult, of real grievance against the Syrian government. Uh, they are uh, viscerally angry over what uh, Syria has done uh, in, in Syria. And I think that this is a bit of a wild card. Syria, Turkey is a powerful country. It's a NATO country. Uh, and it has attempted to enjoy good relations with all the countries of the region. And of course, it's bordering Syria. Uh, but there again, there's no real interest. There's no real national interest in, in, uh, in invading or there has been talk of, of Turkish troops inside Syria, but it's hard to see what interest of Turkey this would actually serve at this point. It's, it's possible. And if, if something big happens, uh, it's going to come from there probably. It will come from, from, uh, from Turkey, not from not from any other surrounding power, not from Iraq, not from Lebanon, not from Israel, not from Jordan. Uh, Professor Provence, thank you so much for spending time with us. We really appreciate your comments. My pleasure. Thanks very much.